Hi, I'm Bob Ellsworth. What have I got in store for you? Oh, all the adventures I've shared, whether they're on islands or offshore or wherever they might be. Had a lot of good times with a lot of wonderful people. Met some very notable people and very, very capable people. And that's what I want to tell you about because there's stories that go with everybody in this world. And that was part of our adventure. And we enjoyed it whenever we went on these adventures. And they were on islands. Sable Island was one of them off the coast of Canada down in Florida for another adventure, and then with Maureen O'Hara, one of my favorite Hollywood actresses, in the adventures of putting together the documentary of the big plane which can be seen up at the New England Air Museum. Join us, won't you? Thank you. Hello there again, Bob Ellsworth here, and tonight's treat for adventure is Queen of the Sky. This concerns something that has passed in aviation history known as the flying boat. You don't see many of those around anymore. They're small craft that still traffic Anchorage, Alaska or up in the wilds of Canada and they're still very, very necessary because they have the capability of landing on water or land. So they're flying planes or boats, a flying boat you might say. But I'm talking about the big passenger ships that for about 20 to 25 years were a, were a, a factor in, in our consideration. And Sikorsky was the one who built the finest, they say, flying boat ever. It's almost the only survivor of the flying boats that we knew in that era of the 20s and 30s when they finally came into fruition. And one of them is on view at the New England Air Museum, right here in Connecticut. And this is where you can see it at any time you want to. It's a beautiful ship. And it was almost wrecked. And you'll hear that story in tonight's presentation. And you'll hear how Maureen O'Hara was responsible, along with Captain Blair, her husband, for turning that ship over to the New England Air Museum to include in their inventory. For all of you people, that is a beautiful museum, and you can't hope to see anything finer than this great historical piece. By the way, what has happened here in the putting the facts together, technically speaking, Charles Lindbergh and Sikorsky got together on the production idea and the possibility of building a fleet of flying boats. There were three of these that you'll see when you go up to the museum. But it was almost gone in terms of where it had rested after its last flight in Florida. And they begged Maureen O'Hara, after she lost Charlie in an unfortunate plane crash, to bring the plane back to New England, which she finally did. Eleven years later, almost the same number of people involved in its construction restored the ship to its natural beauty that you'll see when you go up to the museum. But you'll see it tonight in the Queen of the Sky. Good to see this bird, Harry. It really looks beautiful. And you know, when I looked at it as a small kid, the one thing that hit me was how big it was. What a huge aircraft. How long did you spend re restoring this? How much time was it? Approximately 11 years. 11 years. Yeah, we started in the uh, spring of 88. Uh-huh. And, uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, it was so badly damaged and decayed that uh, it took all that time to do it properly. You're about to hear the story of a magnificent flying boat. The ship, restored and on display at the New England Air Museum, is the sole survivor of three identical planes built by the Vought Sikorsky Aircraft Company during the early 1940s. It's an icon from the golden age of flying boats that spanned nearly two decades and ended just after World War II. You'll hear this story from the people who built and flew this remarkable ship. You'll also hear a story of dedication about people who restored a deteriorating relic of those bygone times. People who cared deeply enough to bring the queen of the sky back to life. It 
it's interesting, you know, you forget about history and you forget that Igor Sikorsky was a great flying boat man and a leader in the technology of flying boats. We know him famous for helicopters, but this bird tells us that he did some very wonderful design work in the giant flying boats as well. My father's interest in the flying boat actually historically went back all the way to Russia in 1912 and 1914 when at the start of World War I he delivered a series of small biplane fighters on floats to the Imperial Russian Navy and at the same time put one of his giant four-engined IM Ilya Muromets prototype aircraft on floats. Later after the revolution he immigrated to the United States and uh, Shortly after he started his own business in 1923, 1924, he began to explore the possibilities of a six to eight passenger twin-engined amphibian. He wanted an aircraft at that time that could take off and land on, from land from the very few limited airports that were in existence at that time in the United States but primarily also any city of any importance in the United States, interestingly, was on the seacoast, on a river, or on a lake, so that all of your major metropolitan centers could be made accessible by flying boat. Probably the kickoff point, the starting point, is the charismatic flight of a young American named Charles Lindbergh across the ocean in May of 1927. That flight triggered such enthusiasm and generated such interest in aviation that airlines began to spring up overnight. And interestingly, Igor Sikorsky almost with a, almost intuitively, had just built a machine called the S-38. Carried pilot, co-pilot, eight passengers, some 200 pounds of mail, and was an amphibian capable of taking off from land or water as the pilot chose. The aircraft was an instant success. The first 10 machines were sold literally right off the assembly line, the majority of them going to a young, relatively unknown airline called Pan American Airways. It was the S-38 that created Sikorsky aircraft, and it was the S-38, one could say, that helped uh, expand Pan American Airways throughout the Caribbean and onto the mainland of South America. The success of the S-38 prompted Pan American to ask Sikorsky to build a larger seaplane that could carry 40 passengers in great comfort over distances of 500 miles. The S-40 emerged as a result of that request. Three were built for Pan American. The first, christened American Clipper, flew its maiden voyage in November of 1931. It would be the first of a long line of Pan American Clippers. The design proved so practical that the model served as a training plane through the end of World War II. Charles Lindbergh, who had been hired by Pan American Airways, and Igor Sikorsky flew the S-40 on her maiden voyage to explore routes throughout the Caribbean. During that flight, the two men, who had become close friends with a deep respect for one another, began to discuss a new aircraft capable of flying 2,500 miles nonstop at a cruising speed of 150 miles an hour, with passenger comfort comparable to a Pullman club car. From sketches on the backs of envelopes and menus by these two aviation pioneers, the S-42 emerged. She was a tribute to the advanced aviation technology of the day. Aluminum replaced the traditional wood and fabric construction. New variable pitch propellers and stronger, more fuel-efficient engines gave the ship superior flying characteristics. It's interesting that it was the very same day that, the United, that Sikorsky aircraft and the rest of the aircraft manufacturers received a letter from the National Aeronautical Association in effect pointing out that America had dropped back significantly in the number of world's records for aircraft, that the then current leader was France with something like 16 world's records, and would the American industry be capable of 
considering uh, some effort in order to reestablish its position in the amount of world's records held. I remember clearly as a child standing there next to the lighthouse at Stratford Point, where the mouth of the Housatonic River, watching this S-42 as it came out of the mist along the coast, flew down, banked ever so slightly over the Stratford Lighthouse, and continued on to New York City. Some six to seven hours later, when the aircraft landed, that very same day that they had received the letter, I remember that with a twinkle in his eye, Charles Lindbergh and Igor Sikorsky sat down and dictated a telegram in which he said that this morning we received your letter of such and such a date requesting us to ex explore the possibility of establishing a number of world's records. This evening, we are proud to say that subject to confirmation, we have established something like 10 world's records for range and payload in one day and uh, according to our unofficial calculations, we have herewith moved the United States to number one position as far as world's records are concerned. By the mid-30s, the name Sikorsky had become synonymous with flying boats in the United States, and Sikorsky and Pan American together had made an indelible mark on the aviation world. About that same time, the Navy asked the aviation industry to design a long-range flying boat that could serve as a patrol bomber capable of carrying large payloads. Several companies accepted the Navy's challenge, and ultimately, the Sikorsky design was accepted. It was designated by the Navy as the XPBS-1. The hull was based in large part on the experience Sikorsky had acquired with the S-42. The design featured all-metal construction and a single high-mounted, fully cantilevered wing. And although the original plan called for four 700 horsepower engines, the Navy specified the newly developed Pratt & Whitney 1,050 horsepower twin wasp radial engines. For its day, the XPBS-1 was heavily armed. There were machine guns mounted in the nose and on each side of the hull. It also had the first tail gun emplacement ever installed on an American aircraft. The overall performance, payload capability, and heavy armament impressed naval personnel and earned the ship the nickname Flying Dreadnought. With World War II looming over the horizon, the Navy put the prototype to work. Admiral Bull Halsey would use the Flying Dreadnought as his flying command post during the early days of the war. The XPBS-1 continued in service until June 1942, when it struck a log while landing and sank. During its life, the plane had logged a respectable 1,365 hours of flight time. Back in the late 1930s, the successful steamship company, American Export Lines, attracted by the growing interest in air travel, had formed a subsidiary called American Export Airlines. They established air routes across the Atlantic and throughout the Caribbean. Now, American Export Airlines needed a long-range flying boat that could serve these routes with economy and comfort. They looked at the performance of the XPBS-1 and said, we could use a civilian version, a commercial passenger carrying version of this aircraft, and uh, signed a contract with Sikorsky, which would lead uh, Sikorsky into taking the basic design of the XPBS and converting it to a passenger airliner. The contract called for the construction of three identical flying boats to be named after American Export's seagoing flagships, Excalibur, Excambian, and Exeter. The redesigned flying boat would be designated the S-44. About this same time, United Aircraft Corporation combined the operations of their Chance Vought Division with the Sikorsky Division, and the S-44 became a joint operation, now designated VS-44A for Vought Sikorsky. Sikorsky engineers use new high-strength aluminum alloys and new structural design techniques to create an aircraft that was remarkably light for its capacity. And while metal was used to cover the hull, wings, and tail assembly, fabric was still used, where possible, to save weight. You're always concerned about weight. Anything you can do to reduce weight is helpful. 
And this particular aircraft was supposed to be a long-range aircraft right across the ocean. And that meant that we had to get the empty weight of the machine down as low as possible. And one of the ways of doing that were, wherever it was possible, to remove metal and use fabric. So the ailerons and the elevators and a couple of other things had the after portion of them uh, covered with fabric. It looked like metal, but it was covered with fabric. The new WASP engines were capable of producing a total of 4,800 horsepower during takeoff. The engines were fitted with three-bladed Hamilton Standard quick feathering propellers for maximum efficiency during takeoffs and cruising. In the design of the VS-44, uh, this whole flight deck was, was really new. And, um, and the uh, one new element of it was that they, all of the controls for the, for the fuel system be uh, available to the flight engineer, and that, um, uh, the, that all four engines could be fed at takeoff horsepower uh, from any one tank. So we have here in the, in the, uh, in the flight deck the, a fume-tight box, which, can, which has all the controls for the fuel system, Technically, it's, f it's fume-proof. Fume uh, I'm not so sure that, uh, that it would, uh, would meet today's standards, but it worked, and, uh, and it was successful in, in all the years of operation. The conversion of the XPBS-1 to a civilian airship gave Sikorsky engineers an opportunity to change some undesirable flight characteristics, one of them being a shaking of the tail that Navy pilots mistook for stalling. Well, as I checked it out in the wind tunnel, saw the airflow coming down, I said, wait a minute, this isn't wing stall at all. This is airflow from the wing impacting the tail and shaking the tail just because it was, it's there. But I found that I could put a little V in the horizontal tail, about 10 degrees, and that would lift the tips of the tail up above the downwash from the wing and immediately we got an increase in gross weight, an increase in lift coefficient, and, and it made all the difference in the world to make the commercial thing so much more feasible than it had been done while it was a Navy ship. The VS-44 had a range of 4,200 miles and a typical cruising speed of 165 miles an hour, which was quite good for transatlantic aircraft of the time. The plane could carry 32 passengers on daytime trips, on transatlantic flights, there were sleeping accommodations for 16 passengers plus a double five-man crew. The passenger cabin, designed by Henry Dreyfus, fulfilled Igor Sikorsky's dream to provide club car comfort. It featured wide, adjustable seats that made into beds, extensive soundproofing, individual reading lights, and an advanced heating and ventilating system. There were also upper berths in each compartment. American Export Airlines had hired one Charles F. Blair as their chief pilot. Captain Blair had been a naval aviator, service number 4748, had flown for United Airlines, and had distinguished himself as an airmail pilot. American Export now loaned Charlie Blair to the Sikorsky plant in Stratford, Connecticut, to work along with the engineers and draftsmen during the design phase of the VS-44A and to make the test and certification flights. Captain Blair took the flying boat out for its initial test flight and immediately fell in love with it. A love affair that would last for nearly four decades. The ship must have sensed Charlie's exuberance. At that moment, uh, the plane just jumped off the water and he said he talked to the plane and said, look here, uh, you don't fly me, I fly you and he put it back on the water again, and then he took it off again, and he went over to the Sikorsky factory and tipped his wings to let all of the people there see what a beautiful plane they built. The first of the three VS-44As was christened Excalibur at a ceremony at the Sikorsky plant on January 17, 1942. The wife of Vice President Henry Wallace did the honors. The christening was uh, a, a, a big celebration outside, bitter cold, um, and on the platform were all the dignitaries of the company, plus Mrs. Wallace. She was armed with a bottle of champagne. Of course, the bow of, the, of this 
machine is uh, is soft. It uh, it is rubber uh, co covered with uh, a canvas, and uh, so to uh, so to sustain uh, mooring problems, you know, bumping into docks and so forth. So um, she struck the. The, the, the nose once and the, and the bottle bounced back in her hand. I think she probably made about six or eight blows until uh, one of the mechanics who was in the, in the mooring hatch up in, up in the bow uh, took the gaff, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, which is a, a, about a six foot long pole with a hook on the end of it, and, uh, and he put that out on, uh, in, on the bow for her to strike, and, and finally it uh, it broke the, the bottle. But it was a uh, nice airplane to fly. Of course, that was the largest airplane that most of us had flown at the time that we were flying it. But it, the controls were uh, medium heavy, as you would expect with a big airplane. Very responsive. When you first tried to get up on the step, <clears throat> as the nose was high, it would throw it. It wasn't a water spray, it was torrents of water uh, right through the nacelles on both sides. And as a result, when that torrent came up through the nacelle, why the propellers, which were running 2,700 RPM at that time, they'd hit that water and there was the most horrible thud and thunk you ever saw, and it uh, bothered the people. <coughs> it lost a lot of RPM, but as it went through that particular stage, uh, it uh, picked up RPM and, and, and the uh, spray, or what I call it, or torrents uh, stopped. And then from then on, it was a normal uh, takeoff. But the uh, pilots, uh, being land plane pilots, they didn't think so much of that, and uh, so they wanted Mr. Sikorsky to do something about it. So they took the uh, pictures of the uh, spray tests, as they called them, and uh, showed them to Mr. Sikorsky. Mr. Sikorsky would kind of mumble and not, you know, not bad, not bad. And the pilots heard him says, what do you mean not bad? That's awful. He said, well, gentlemen, if you realize that I designed that haul for 45,000 pounds, and you're flying it at 60,000 pounds, I say that's not bad. And he was sure right. America was at war on two fronts when Sikorsky delivered the three flying boats to American export airlines in early 1942. The ships, affectionately dubbed the Flying Aces, were quickly put into service as part of a contract American export had with the Navy to fly military and government personnel to neutral ports, such as Foynes, Ireland, and open ports in Africa once it was liberated by the Allies. Although the VS-44As were capable of flying non-stop between New York and Foynes with a full payload, they usually made a refueling stop along the way. The routes taken depended on the season and wind conditions. Botwood, Newfoundland, was one of the regular stopovers. In the winter time, uh, we had uh, we would go down, we'd go to New York to Foynes uh, direct, nonstop. But we couldn't come back that way because, or even go that way because the uh, botwood uh, was uh, frozen over in the winter time. So we would go from uh, <coughs> Foynes. Like I said we'd go from uh, New York to uh, Foynes uh, nonstop. <coughs> but if the winds were unfavorable, we'd go to New York Bermuda Foynes. On the return flight, we go Foynes to Port Leone, which is a big naval base in uh, French Morocco. From there to Bathurst, at that time it was called British Gambia. And from Bathurst, we had the options either Belém, Port of Spain, or San Juan, depending upon load and wind. And of course, uh, New York would be the last stop. American Export Airlines was pioneering transatlantic air service, and their stewardesses contributed in large measure to their success. Dorothy Bohanna was the very first stewardess to make a transatlantic flight from the U.S. on a commercial airplane. As required on such overseas flights, Dorothy was a registered nurse. Most people felt, and I did too when I first went with the company, that the reason they uh, had nurses on board, required nurses, all the big airlines required them, and the reason they did that was because of their medical knowledge. Actually, as it turned out, the real reason was they were used to being on their own. They had night duty. They could stay up at night and be trusted not to sleep. They could make decisions without having someone there to go to. Those were the, really the reasons why 
they had an RN. Since Ireland remained neutral during the war, Foynes was an important link for military personnel with business in London. But military people had to dress in civilian clothes according to international law. The funny part of it was, the man who was head of customs there in Ireland used to tell me years later, he said, Daddy, I knew who they were. He said, one thing that gave them away, and they, in, all of them did it, they would have these fedora hats on, but when they would come in and you'd ask them their name, the hat would go under their arm. <laughs> and you knew that was their military cap that was under their arm. It was a dead giveaway. <laughs> in October of 1942, Excalibur crashed during takeoff from Botwood. Six passengers and five crew members died. The investigators blamed the cause on the actions of an inexperienced pilot and not to any mechanical failure of the aircraft. Exeter and Excambian continued to fly passengers, cargo and mail to Ireland and other neutral ports in support of the war effort. Among the passengers on these various flights were notables, such as General Omar Bradley, USO performers like Humphrey Bogart, Edward G. Robinson, and Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. Public figures like Eleanor Roosevelt, and on one special flight, Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands. That was a very notable trip. She um, was in exile in London, and had gone over to visit her daughter, who was in Canada with her children. They had the airplane fixed so that there were only the Queen and I think maybe four men of her uh, brigade or whatever they were, uh, with ours would probably be a Secretary of State. But anyway, uh, these people were, they had her fixed at the, uh, this back stateroom was, this was her private quarters. And apparently I reminded her of her people, my coloring, I was blonde and and fair skin, and um, she would ask me to come and sit. I think when she got blue, because she'd ask me to come and sit and talk to her. And uh, she'd ask me questions of where I lived, my family life, and things about me personally. I think it was just that she wanted to look at me and, and see some rationality or some home life or something, what she was getting into when she got to London. Excambian and Exeter continued in service until the Navy's contract with the American Export Airlines expired at the end of 1944. The two remaining S-44s ended up by uh, being sold by American Export Airlines as it itself was bought out by Pan American. Pan American was then already shifting to land planes rather than the long-range seaplanes. The primary reason was the fact that uh, during World War II, enough airports had been built around the world to enable the land plane to be able to compete very successfully with the flying boat. And consequently, with uh, the arrival of giant airports in Botwood and in Shannon and uh, Gander, uh, Goose Bay, wherever you wanted to, you could fly with perfect safety with a land plane across the ocean. And the day of the great uh, flying boat slowly came to an end. The VS-44A was pretty much the culmination of flying boat development in this country. And the three flying aces racked up some impressive statistics in their three years of service during World War II. Charlie Blair made the five fastest consecutive overseas flights in the Sikorskys, setting new transatlantic records for the fastest nonstop flights between New York and foreign ports. The VS-44As also made the first non-stop flights with passengers and mail between New York and Lisbon, Baltimore and Europe, Bermuda and North Africa, and Africa to Trinidad. Flying for American export airlines, the VS-44As were in service to an airline longer than any other commercial aircraft at the time. And the only aircraft that flew commercial schedules non-stop with a capacity payload across the North and South Atlantic on flights in excess of 3,100 miles. The last transatlantic flight of a VS-44 was on October 25, 1944, from Foynes, Ireland to New York. The pilot in command was Captain Charles Blair. As the plane lifted off the water, 
he flew a circle around Foynes in tribute to the town's support of their flying efforts during the war. The two remaining S-44s, if I remember correctly, uh, were sold to various owners, went through a series of owners. One of them ended up in South America and uh, with some rather interesting and somewhat shady people flying it. It was used to smuggle, it was a gun, gun running operation, used to smuggle uh, guns up and down the uh, up and down South America. I don't remember exactly where and how, but I do know that it eventually ended up by making a crash landing uh, on the Ria Plata. In 1955, after unsuccessful attempts to use it for commercial service in South America, the last remaining VS-44 Excambian NC-41881 was put in storage at Ancon Harbor in Lima, Peru, where it came to the attention of Wilton, Dick Probert, and Walter von Kleinsmith, co-owners of Avalon Air Transport in Long Beach, California. Avalon Air Transport was a scheduled airline with regular service to various cities in California, as well as between Long Beach and Catalina Island. Probert and von Kleinsmith thought the Sikorsky would be a valuable addition to their fleet of Grumman Gooses. Dick flew to Peru to examine the plane. I went back to Lima and uh, proceeded to put the airplane in the water and uh, fly it and uh, it was satisfactory. I put gasoline in it, started home, two engines quit and so I had a, uh, a situation that was really uh, complex. In other words, I was in an area that I was not familiar with. I was in an airplane I'd only made one takeoff and landing in. I had it overloaded with gasoline so I could make it non-stop to Long Beach. And uh, because I was doing the celestial navigation myself, why uh, I waited until nighttime. So it was night and we're at 8,000 feet, the cruising altitude for the airplane and uh, these two engines quit and it was so heavy with gasoline that uh, there's no way I could handle it uh, as far as going on with it uh, with two engines out. So I uh, turned around, went back, and made a night landing in a harbor that I was entirely unfamiliar with. It was full of fishing boats with no lights on them. To make it commercially economical to operate, when Probert finally got the Sikorsky to California, he modified it so it could be flown by just two pilots, saving the expense of a flight engineer and a radio operator. He also modified the galley and cabin areas to increase passenger capacity. In October 1957, the Sikorsky, painted in the colors of Avalon Air Transport, began regularly scheduled flights between Long Beach and Catalina Island. Dick needed a stewardess to handle these daily flights and hired a young lady named Nancy Ince. Nancy took quickly to her new life as stewardess, and Dick took a liking to his new stewardess. They were married in June 1965. Nancy was the granddaughter of famous silent movie director Thomas H. Ince. Probert himself was no stranger to the movies. He'd been an actor since the 1940s and appeared in several TV adventure series in the 1960s. During the ten and a half years that the Proberts operated the Sikorsky flying boat as part of Avalon Air Transport, they made more takeoffs and landings and transported more passengers than any previous owner. But age eventually caught up with Dick Probert. After ten years, uh, uh, I hit uh, 65 years old and there's a federal regulation that you cannot fly in scheduled airline operation uh, past 60. And uh, did I say I was 65? I was 60 in 1967. And uh, so I had to get out of the airplane. And because it was so complicated, taxiing the airplane in and out of Avalon Harbor among all the boats, that uh, he just couldn't find uh, any pilots that could do it. The availability of the VS-44A came to the attention of the owner of Antilles Airboats, a commuter seaplane service operating in the U.S. Virgin Islands. 
That owner turned out to be Charles F. Blair, the very same pilot who initially tested the big Sikorskys for American Export Airlines and subsequently commanded them on their transatlantic flights during World War II. Charlie Blair still had a deep affection for the giant Sikorsky flying boat and was delighted to add the ship to his growing fleet of Grumman Gooses. Uh, Antilles airboats uh, began in 1963 and the reason that it did begin was because Charlie at that time was spending his free time in St. Croix in the United States Virgin Islands and it took almost a full day to get from there over to St. Thomas and to get to the other islands was very very difficult. In 1968 Charlie Blair married movie actress Maureen O'Hara they had become close friends after meeting in the late 1940s when he flew her to her native Ireland. Maureen retired from the film world and became vice president of Antilles Airboats, taking an active part in running the airline along with Charlie and his son, Chris. She also published a magazine called The Virgin Islander and authored monthly articles covering everything from food to movies to family life in the islands. She often featured stories about the Sikorsky flying boat Charlie's Queen. Charlie always referred to the S-44 as the Queen of the Sky. And uh, it's something that a lot of people don't know, but many great pilots uh, are teased by their wives and their children that their airplane that they love is their girlfriend. And uh, the Sikorsky was his girlfriend. It wasn't, no, it was his queen. It was the queen of the sky, and he always referred to her as his queen of the sky. And uh, he referred to me as the queen of the earth. And he referred to himself as the king of the sky. And he was. The aircraft had come back to its very sentimental pilot, Charlie Blair. And it flew in the Caribbean between all of the islands uh, for a little, I think it was a little over a year and coming through the cut in St. Thomas, they reduced the speed on the aircraft, and when they got through the cut, they tried to pick the speed up again, and it didn't happen. I, do, I don't know what the reason was, I'm not a mechanic, and the plane drifted and hit a rock, and it damaged uh, one side of the aircraft, and so it was put up on its cradle on the St. Thomas ramp, and uh, Charlie discovered that to sort of repair the aircraft and do other things that were needed to bring it back up to its number one condition was a little too expensive for, um, uh, for our Antilles airboats. So it sat on the ramp and uh, every day all the workers and everybody would say good morning to the Queen and hello and how are you and they talked to the plane. It was wonderful. And some people suggested that why didn't Charlie turn it into a very high-class restaurant? But he really didn't want that. He wanted, uh, he didn't want to see food being s cooked and served on his beautiful qu queen of the sky. So he started realizing that the plane had to be fine, had to find a, a final resting place and since it was originally bought or designed for the Navy and wore the Navy's colors, uh, he thought the best thing to do was to donate it to Pensacola, where he graduated as a naval aviator, to go into the uh, aviation museum there. In September 1978, tragedy struck. An engine exploded on the Grumman Goose Charlie Blair was flying. The plane plummeted into the water and sank. Charlie, along with three of his ten passengers, died in the crash. The accident ended a brilliant aviation career. Charlie Blair had set transatlantic records with the Sikorsky flying boats. He was the owner of a successful airline. After retiring from the Navy, he joined the Air Force and distinguished himself by flying a series of record-breaking flights over the North Pole between New York and London in his own P-51 Mustang, the first person to fly a single-engine plane over that route. During those flights, Blair developed a new navigation system which was adopted by the Air Force. 
by opening the North Pole route to Europe. He helped shape America's defense strategies during the Cold War years. Blair went on to receive the Distinguished Flying Cross and eventually rose to the rank of Brigadier General. Maureen was elected by the stockholders to take charge of Antilles airboats after Charlie's fatal accident. She successfully operated the airline for several years, but eventually Maureen sold the company and returned to her acting career. Meanwhile, even though the Navy had accepted Charles Blair's donation of the VS-44, nothing was being done to restore her. Since the flying boat had only been under contract to the Navy, it wasn't, in the strict sense, a naval warplane, so it wasn't very high on their priority list for reconstruction. The plane languished for years in the museum's outside storage area, where it was exposed to the elements and began to deteriorate. And a very fine man from the uh, museum in Washington, D.C., uh, Bob Mickish, called me and he said, Maureen, the queen is going to be lost if you don't do something about it. They're not going to rebuild her and put her in the museum. She's going to just rust away. And he said, you must take it away from the Navy and give it to the museum in New England. And being stubborn Irish, I said, no, 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 no. Charlie wanted that to be in the museum in Pensacola, and that's where it's going to be, and I'll contact the Secretary of the Navy and everything else. And uh, nothing happened. And then Bob called me again, and he said, Maureen, please, I'm begging you and begging you for the last time. You know Charlie doesn't want that plane to disappear. And then I finally listened to Bob Mickish, and I said, all right, I will ask and request that it be sent to the, the museum in New England. The VS-44 is a very significant airplane, as we all know, in that it's the last of the big commercial four-engine flying boats built in this country. It's a Sikorsky product. It uh, was built here in Connecticut. Being the only survivor of the, of the airplane, the flying boat of that era, was always important to us. Uh, some of the museum people at the time followed it with great interest from the time that Dick Probert was flying it in California as a, as a ferry boat, if you will, to, to Long Beach, from Long Beach to, to Catalina. Uh, followed with great interest when Charlie Blair and Maureen O'Hara were operating it in the uh, Caribbean. So always had an eye on that uh, airplane, wondering how and when it might be retired and would there be a chance that the museum could somehow acquire that airplane. So the interest was there for, for quite a while. Finally, in 1983, after some negotiation, the Navy agreed that the plane belonged in a civilian museum and made a permanent loan of the Sikorsky to the New England Air Museum in Windsor Locks, Connecticut. Harvey Lippincott, who was the, uh, worked for United Technologies at the time at Pratt & Whitney, was the archivist for United Technologies. And Harvey had some friends at Sikorsky, and Harvey contacted us and said, would Sikorsky be interested in restoring the flying boat for, at that time, it was the Bradley Air Museum, which is currently the New England Air Museum. While Tony Ravino formed a committee to consider restoring the VS-44A, the plane was barged from Pensacola to the Sikorsky plant at Bridgeport, Connecticut, to await the committee's findings. It was really a very exciting conversation with uh, Tony and, and his uh, group because they came in and said it would be a relatively simple task. It wouldn't cost any money or very little. And, and if I really wanted to get it done, all I had to do was say, go do it. And I said, go do it. And off Tony went with his group. Tony Ravino's committee was able to assemble a team of over 120 volunteers, many who had worked on the original Flying Aces in the 1940s. But what was needed was a team leader who could get the job done. The name of Harry Haliva came up. Harry retired from Sikorsky back in 1977, okay? He was a field rep for Sikorsky, and his particular assignment at the time he retired was a field rep supporting the uh, executive mission down in Quantico, which flies the President of the United States. So when uh, uh, Harry retired, uh, he was 
His wife was trying to keep him busy with the, with the honey do this and honey do that kind of stuff. And uh, so when the restoration team got together, we started putting down a list of all of the people that we knew that were available, that had the skills, and more than just the skill, you know, it takes a certain type of individual who is going to lead a group of volunteers. You lead by example. And so that, so when we made this list, it was quite simple when we came to Harry's name that he should be our choice. I got a call from Sikorsky asking if I'd be interested in a restoration of the Scambian. Well, I talked to my wife about it. She said, look, why not? You're doing things for everybody else. Why not do something you like? So uh, I uh, made an appearance when they asked me to, and we talked it over, and I agreed to take it. Sikorsky set up a temporary building for the team to use, provided tools and blueprints, and access to facilities within the factory as well as other resources. And so the team began to restore the Sikorsky flying boat. Almost at once, all the earlier estimates of time and cost evaporated as the team discovered far more internal damage than anyone could have imagined. Years of neglect and exposure to the weather had left their mark on the exterior. But far worse, seawater had entered the hull over the years and heavily corroded the main spar and bulkheads. Much of the outer skin had to be completely removed so that badly damaged internal members could be replaced or patched. Work that was much more difficult and complex than building the original plane from scratch. The team faced other challenges. Many components on the aircraft were just no longer available on the market. The volunteers put their creativity and Yankee ingenuity to work. A metal vegetable bin from an old refrigerator became the galley sink. Parts from an old drinking fountain served as lavatory faucets. Well, parts, they weren't available. And also, uh, fixtures to manufacture these parts weren't available. We had to make our own. Radio gear came from one of our volunteers, Vic Politi. Those that we couldn't get, Vic had photos of. And we had the cases made by our people, and then they were finished off by Vic himself and uh, looked like the original. Bob Cowell, who was a historian then, nailed me and of course there was no cockpit. And I said, being a radio ham, I said, who's gonna do the radio gear on that? And his eyes lit up and he said, let me show you some pictures. And I said, my God, I got half of that stuff in my basement. So he said, would you like to undertake it? You know, he said, Bob Howie, who was the flight deck guy at that time, he said, uh, talk to Bob Howie. So I talked to Bob Howie and I got nailed. And I loved every minute of it. It, uh, it was just great. I think you had a fellow by the name of Joe Lasardo here recently. Now, Joe put in some 13,000 hours, and he made fixtures such as uh, the windshield glass. I made this form and took the plexiglass and clamped it onto the form and brought it home, put it in my wife's oven, and I set the oven at 350 degrees and put it in there for about five or six minutes. When I took it out, it was in the winter time. I had heavy gloves on and I put it out on the back porch and when it cooled off enough for me to handle it, I took the clamps out and sure enough that contour was perfect. It just fit that form perfectly. The engines that came with the aircraft were so badly corroded we couldn't save them. So we had to go out and beg for engines and fortunately we were able to go to uh, the Air Museum at Quantico, Virginia. And they supplied us with one engine. We got uh, two engines from a school in Long Island. The uh, last engine we got, uh, we found one here out of a wreck of a C-47 that the New England Air Museum had. And we uh, took that, took it over to uh, aviation training school at the Skorsky Memorial Airport and the students there tore it down, rebuilt it for us, and even repainted the baffles. So it was like new when we got it. We had a group of guys, we called them our, our expediters. There were two guys, Bill Smethurst and Carl McDonald. 
They were always wandering around Sikorsky trying to get parts made for, for the flying boat. So those were our, our they, jokingly we used to call him Alibaba and, and his thief. <laughs> Finally, after 11 years of constant labor and over $1 million in expenses, the restored hull was ready to be joined to the wing assembly. Because of the size of the completed aircraft, the plan was to move the hull and wing separately by truck from Stratford to the museum at Windsor Locks and assemble them there. And because the tail assembly was too high to clear the underpasses along the route, a special cradle was built so the hull could be transported to the museum lying on its side. The final assembly of the restored Sikorsky took place during the summer of 1998, and in November of that year, the ship was ready for public display. The museum staged an elaborate recommissioning ceremony for NC-41881, held in the shadow of the restored ship. It was a gala night, and speakers paid homage to the people who built the plane, who flew her, and who spent the past 11 years restoring the Queen to her original glory. Not forgotten was Charles F. Blair and his contribution to aviation history. A plaque commemorating his brilliant career was unveiled that evening and put on display at the museum alongside his beloved flying boat. a lot of time and effort into this and sometimes I wonder what your dad might think of the mm. I'll tell you Harry I'll tell you Harry if seriously he'd be very happy he'd be very proud it's in a way a monument don't forget that not many people remember that uh, Igor Sikorsky was a world leader in the flying boat business before he got into helicopters and you know it is a kind of an interesting product of Connecticut the aircraft was designed and built here. The engines are... Pratt and Whitney. Propellers were Hamilton. And, of course, the, uh, the work was done by Vought Sikorsky Aircraft. Mm -hmm. Stratford, Connecticut. Yeah. Well, I think United Technologies can be congratulated on their effort here. It was their patience, their money. But this is a great monument to Connecticut and to Igor Sikorsky. Thinking back to uh, Igor Sikorsky's dream of, uh, of going into a, a luxurious cabin, and that was luxurious for the time in history, and uh, thinking about flying in some luxurious cabin, just it, it, it's proof that that dream came true, and the dream of all the volunteers. I look at all of the sweat and blood and time that the hundreds of thousands of hours that the volunteers put into it is just fantastic. To me, a, a museum, any museum, I don't care if it's an art museum or an aviation museum or whatever, a museum is a place really where we should celebrate human achievement. We as people have done all these incredibly wonderful things. And you know, sometimes we just take these things for granted, whether it's the telephone, an airplane, uh, a work of art or whatever it is. And this is the place, this is the kind of place where we celebrate that human achievement. And I'm just really proud that the airplane is here. What I like to do is, I love to give tours of the museum and my favorite is the flying boat. And as I'm giving the tour and explaining its history and what it was designed to do and all that, you know, we try and go back and think and imagine what it must have been like to have crossed the Atlantic Ocean in that airplane Whereas nowadays you could fly from New York to Ireland where the 44 went. You could do that in five hours for heaven's sakes or four and a half hours maybe. That in this airplane you'd be flying under 10,000 feet and droning on and on through the night over the cold, stormy, dark waters of the North Atlantic. And, and what an exciting adventure that must have been.
The big flying boats are all but gone from our skies and waters. But thanks to a group of dedicated volunteers and a generous corporation, together they've brought this majestic example of the great ships back to life. And even if the Queen can't return to the sky, she'll reign for posterity on her royal earthly throne. Well, she's a queen. A queen is a queen. And she'll never be anything else but Charlie's queen.